Welcome to Worship at St. Paul's. This week, we have a few quick announcements. First, our soup suppers are in full swing. Join us on Wednesday nights for fun and interesting conversation and delicious soup. Second, our preschool registration is now open. If you or a family member are interested in our preschool, go to our website for more information. And finally, today we're excited to welcome new members at our 11 o'clock service. It's going to be a beautiful time where we welcome new people into the community of the faith. And now, let us continue in worship. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 13th chapter. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible 
for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. If you had three wishes, how would you use them? That came up this past week with my daughter. She had a pretty clever answer, maybe slightly terrifying. Dad, if I had three wishes, first I would wish for every power imaginable. I thought, all right, she's human. At least I know she's human. Second, Dad, I would wish that nobody else could control my powers. Okay, now I thought I, I'm getting a little nervous. This is quite the scheme. And at last, I would wish for the genie to go free. All right, the Aladdin-inspired compassion comforted me a bit. Her three wishes... We have three wishes in Luke's gospel. It's the same word in Greek each time, wishing for something or willing something. And I'm curious how these three wishes affect you, how they leave you feeling. First, we hear Herod's wish to kill. Then we hear God's wish to take us in like a hen. And lastly, we hear about our wish to go in some other direction than where God is calling us. Let's start with that first one. From the beginning of the story in Luke, the whole gospel, Luke shows that conflict is going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Jesus was a baby. He was in the temple. And a man named Simeon came and he prophesied, Behold, this child is set. For the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against. From the moment Jesus was born, conflict was already following him. And then, just some weeks ago, we heard about Jesus first teaching in the synagogue, beginning his teaching. He was in his hometown. And from then, he was pursued by enemies. There at the synagogue, and then at banquets, and pursued along the road. And so the Pharisees' warning to Jesus comes as no surprise. Jesus, Herod's trying to kill you. you got to get out of here. Herod Antipas, if you remember, was the Roman-appointed leader in Galilee where Jesus grew up. I had mentioned a, a month or so ago that Galilee was about the size of Bucks County and Mon Montgomery County together. And so Herod had about the same jurisdiction as Brian Fitzpatrick and Madeline Dean. The only difference being that Herod could chop people's heads off and get away with it. I don't think that's happened for those two representatives yet. That's what happened to Jesus' predecessor. Some say Jesus' mentor, John the Baptist. What happened to his head? Herod chopped it off. When Herod feels threatened or things don't go his way or he just makes a rash decision, like the case for John the Baptist, things can get ugly. Get out of here, Jesus. Herod wishes to kill you. Have you ever had an ugly wish towards someone? I think we're all capable of it, even if we're not as violent as Herod. I confess to recently having an ugly wish toward my dog. It was this past week. Abigail was away on a business trip all week. And I don't know about you, but has your, your spouse ever left on a business trip for a week and your dog was so anxious about her absence that your dog woke you up at 3 a.m. every night? By coming to the side of your bed and panting like a Tyrannosaurus Rex? I have. 
I've had that happen. I had some ugly wishes towards man's best friend. Best friends aren't supposed to wake each other up like that. And if I close the door, he just scratches on it, so that doesn't work. Abigail got home last night, and sure enough, the dog slept through the night. Of course, it was daylight savings time, so I lost an hour of sleep anyway. But we felt that before, those bad wishes towards someone. I felt like a caveman on some of those nights this week. Wishes get ugly when we feel like someone's taking something from us or when we feel like we're threatened in some way. So there's wish number one, an ugly wish. Jesus hears it and he defiantly replies, tell that fox for me that I am going to finish my work. So much for Herod's wish. Jesus is not intimidated by the violent people of the world. Something we can take comfort in these days. God has a greater concern and will not be deterred. Which takes us to the second wish we hear in Luke's gospel today. God's wish for her people. I say her on purpose here. We're very intentional about language at St. Paul's, a church guided by intellect, we like to say. We know that God is neither male nor female. God is God. But the Bible was written by men, and so we've been handed a bias for a lot of male language. God the Father, King of Kings, crown him with many crowns. But today we have a refreshing contrast, and so I wanted to highlight it for a bit. Jesus speaks of himself or of God with female language. In verse 34, Jesus is lamenting, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Jesus expresses a maternal instinct to watch out for us, to protect us. I don't know why Jesus chose a hen to be the language for that. He could have chosen a bear. There were bears around there. There are bears in Scripture. Jesus would have heard about it in the prophets. There's a, a, a verse in Hosea that talks about the bear protecting her cubs, pursues the, 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 the predator and tears them apart. But Jesus went with a hen image instead. And so I, I took a moment to look up a video of a hen protecting its chicks, and, and I was actually pretty impressed. There was a video of a crow trying to attack the chicks, and the hen pecked and jumped at the crow until it, it went away. It's a strong quality, this maternal instinct to protect. Jesus is talking, I think, about first sound kind of people. It occurred to me this past week as well, while Abigail was gone, that there are first sound and second sound kind of people when it comes to caring for children. Maybe you'll track what I'm saying. I'm more of a second sound kind of person. Let me explain. In my experience, children make a lot of sounds. They run into walls, they fall from couches, and they fall off chairs. First sound people more like my children's mother, hear the child tumble down a few stairs and they lovingly sprint across the house to check if anyone got hurt. Second sound people, like I, hear the first sound and wonder, huh, that sounded like it might have hurt. But I'm a little self-interested, so I just sit there and keep doing what I'm doing and I wait for the second sound, the decibel of the child's cry at which point I'll decide whether or not I get up or not. First sound people and second sound people. Thank God for mothers or for the motherly. First sound people. I think God has this kind of responsiveness toward us, toward our needs, towards our tumbles. It's not an anxious hovering, but an attentive readiness and a desire to offer us care and harbor. It's not that God protects us from falling down the stairs, 
It happens. God responds. We say at St. Paul's, God offers minimum protection, but maximum support. And Jesus says that support comes in gathering, like a hen gathers her brood, which becomes real in the ways that we gather a spiritual community. About 60 of us felt this peace and comfort from gathering at the soup supper last Wednesday. I think it hit so many people. There was about, like I said, 60 of us there. And it was this time two years ago where all of that kind of gathering came to an end. I can remember that last soup supper. About 20 people showed up before the lockdown. We felt that return. It was a harbor to go back to it this last Wednesday. We feel it in other places. We'll hear about small groups later today. I joined the choir rehearsal a few weeks ago, and I sensed that spirit of harbor in their gathering for rehearsal. Where two or three are gathered, I am there with them. Like a hen gathers her chicks, God's wish is that all people would be gathered and harbored as we make our way through this world. But as the gospel said, we wished for something else. Our third wish. Jesus said, I wanted to gather you up, people of Jerusalem. But you did not wish it. Why? Why do we go elsewhere? Why do we go astray? Some of you are, might remember our confession. We used to say we have erred and strayed like lost sheep. Why do we go astray? It seems to be the human condition. That's the name of a little book by Thomas Keating. I've mentioned it before. It's called The Human Condition. It's the one book I read every year. It helps that it's only 45 pages long. That's part of why I can do it. You might have thought it was the Bible, right? The pastor, read the Bible every year? No. 45 pages, human condition. Keating introduces the human condition by telling a story. It's of a man who lost the key to his house, and he's looking for it in the grass outside. And some no neighbors noticed he was looking for the key, and so they came to help search for the key. And the sun started growing hot, and they all started getting weary. And one of the neighbors asked, have you any idea where you might have lost the key? Of course, the man replied. I, I lost it in the house. Then why are we looking for it out here? The neighbor asked. The man said, isn't it obvious? There is more light here. The human condition. We're looking some, for something where it seems like it's a little easier to find. Looking for something. Keating calls it happiness. But we're looking in the wrong place. Keating writes about all the programs for happiness that take us astray. All the programs that we come up with. There are obvious unhealthy ones. Looking for wealth, looking for power, looking for prestige. There are even healthier programs for happiness that aren't bad. Investing in our families or our neighborhoods, a meaningful career, service to the community, a great vacation and rest. The problem, Keating said, is when we treat those things as if they were the ultimate as if they were the destination and not a means to an end. Keating writes, Every human pleasure is meant to be a stepping stone to knowing God better or to discovering some new aspect of God. That's what gets us back into the house where the key is. But rather than a stepping stone, we treat those things like destinations. I'll give an example in my own life. My work as a pastor. It's a good thing. It's meaningful work. I love it. I love working with this 
congregation. It's a role that's even in service of God's church, God's people. But even that is not where the key is going to be found. Keating writes, part of life is a process of dropping whatever role, however worthy, you identify with. It is not you. And so I can hear my spiritual director, Sister Barbara, whenever I tell her of something that went well at church, maybe a pastoral care moment or a sermon where I I preached something and several people shared with me how it connected. It was a, a positive experience. And she always stops and she says, Thomas, did you thank God for that? Do you see how she connected a really meaningful role and experience in my life, but helped me see it as a stepping stone to communion with God? Just with that simple question, did you thank God for that? She never says it to make me feel bad, though I always feel a little guilty when I say, oh, I forgot again. She doesn't say it to make me feel bad, but to help me connect my role as a pastor to my deepest identity as a child of God, a chick of God, to experience communion with God through a little prayer of gratitude. Maybe that's an invitation for you with your latest moment of blessing or success. Did you thank God for that? An invitation to connect our roles in life back to the source of life. Otherwise, we're doing good stuff, but missing out on the deep stuff. A wise monk put it like this, observing humans doing this. He says, it reminds me of people sitting in a rowboat, very earnest, vigorously paddling away with great sincerity, rowing and rowing and rowing, and they refuse to untie the boat from the dock. From the beginning, God has been telling us to untie the rope. Keep paddling, but untie the rope. Since the beginning, that's the story of Adam and Eve. All God wanted to do was be in communion with them, as the story goes. But it's been a challenge. A challenge for God, but a challenge that God has not given up on. Which takes us finally beyond the three wishes to the will in the story, the will of God. Jesus does more than wish for our happiness. He promises it. Unlike Herod, unlike us, the will of God is unshakable. In this passage, we see Jesus on the march. Nothing's going to stop him. One scholar put it this way, he found in this passage, A reminder that the way of the determined Messiah is that God's mission will not, cannot be deterred. God won't force peace and happiness upon us, but God will, with infinite persistence, beckon us back into the house where the key is to be found. Beckon us into the harbor of those hen's wings. God's going to stick with it, prophet after prophet, word after word, sacrifice after sacrifice to get our attention. It's over here. Frederick Beekner wrote, God never seems to weary of trying to get himself across. Word after word, he tries in search of the right word. When the creation itself doesn't seem to say it right, sun, moon, stars, God tries flesh and blood. Three wishes. How would you use them for your life? All the powers of the world, no one could tell you what to do with them. Or maybe as you think about Luke, you'd wish for something else. We go about wishing and wandering in this life. And God just wishes for us that we'd come back to the shelter of her wings. 
God wishes for us the greatest peace and goodness and happiness found on a spiritual journey we may have yet to begin. And in fact, God does more than wish. God will. Let us pray. God of our life and hope, in this season of Lent we ask you to trouble us with such visions of who you are and such knowledge of your will that our hearts would be touched into love again, calmed into quietness, and be ordered and disposed to your service. Help us not to live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Remind us that how we treat a pet, a child, a co-worker, a spouse, or neighbor is how we treat you. When mean-spirited words or acts cut at our neighbors, help us express regret and seek reconciliation. When we abuse ourselves in thought or deed, help us remember your wings and seek your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God of justice and might, hinder the Herods still alive today, those who seek to kill rather than prosper life, those who tear down rather than build up. We remember the people of Ukraine, the dire situations of besieged citizens, fleeing families, and weary soldiers and volunteers. We heard the psalm chanted today, Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war rise up against me, my trust will not be shaken. We pray this would be true for all who live under the fear and threat of violence. 
As the prophet Amos said, Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness as an ever-flowing stream. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, attend to those expecting a child and console those who have experienced miscarriage. Comfort veterans enduring post-traumatic stress. Shield those endangered by domestic violence. Uphold those who are ill or grieving and be with all in need, especially those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, one thing we ask, one thing we seek, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. We give thanks for those whose labors on earth are ended. Hear us as we remember them before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ, through whom we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.